Hey folks, this is Alexander Wynn. And Le- <laughs> We're off to a good start. And Le- <laughs> You want me to take it from here? <laughs> Hi folks, this is Alexander Wynn and Lacey Hannon. We're here to talk to you about the first three chapters of The Martian today. <laughs> All right, so is, I'll, I'll I just, would I'll never, just take it from I here. would never do well on SNL. <laughs> I would, I would break constantly. Yeah. Oh my god! Sorry, yeah, guys. The camera, hey, she's just I'm... like, it's on you, and Lacey just cracks up. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> hey, listen, there were things happening. I apologize. <laughs> yeah. All right. So for the last couple of weeks, we've been talking about uh, Apollo 13 and gravity. We sort of accidentally fell into a space disaster series. My favorite. Yep. So why not keep it going? Uh, This week, we're going to be talking about The Martian, the first three chapters. We're going to be taking it week by week and working our way through the book because this book is dense. It's awesome, but there's a lot going on. There is a lot going on. And I like it for that that reason, as a matter of fact. I've been looking forward to doing The Martian because The Martian is fantastic. Mm -hmm. So while Lacey finds her chill, I'm going to give some background. (laughs) Listen, at least I'm obviously the fun one here. (laughs) Uh, leave me alone. Um, so, The Martian was written by Andy Weir. Uh, it is the novel on which the movie is based, of course. Uh, he started writing it in 2009. Andy Weir is the son of a particle physicist and an electrical engineer. Oh, well, so, no wonder. Yeah, exactly. If I had parents um, that smart, I'd be smarter <laughs> too. <laughs> uh, he had a background in computer science. He began writing it in 2009 uh, just for fun to sort of see how this would go. Apparently, I didn't know this until today, but apparently he had already had a webcomic called Casey and Andy, which had this same premise, being stranded on Mars. Hmm. Uh, I take it Andy is him and Casey is... I have no idea. This is oh, straight off of Wikipedia. <laughs> um, <laughs> he did He did some well-researched uh, work for you guys. Four minutes before we went on, it, on the air, yeah. Uh, so uh, one thing that I really love about this story is the response that he had to this series. He started publishing it as a blog, uh, and people started finding it. In particular, people in the space science community started finding it, and they started feeding him information. He would present a problem in one chapter, and then he'd start getting emails from people who, like, literally work at NASA, being like, here's how we would approach that problem. And it became this whole thing. So apparently he had been burned by literary agents before, so he just didn't even bother trying to get this thing published. So he just started putting it out online. And people asked him to make a Kindle version so that they could read it on their Kindle. You know, that's nice. Uh, But apparently, you know, he wasn't in it for the money. He just wanted these people to be able to read what he was reading in the Mm -hmm. most convenient format. Mm -hmm. But on Kindle, you have to have it cost at least 99 cents. So he put it up for 99 cents and it shot to the top of Amazon's sci-fi bestsellers. Oh. <laughs> Just like this little convenience thing that he did for his for his fans. Um, he ended up selling the rights uh, to a genuine publisher. It debuted on the New York Times bestseller list in both hardcover and paperback versions. There's an There was an audiobook version by someone named R.C. Bray, but then it was re-released narrated by Will Wheaton. And for those who uh, don't know, Will Wheaton is super famous in the nerd community. He played Wesley Crusher on Star Trek The Next Generation and now is like a super guru in all things like tabletop gaming and nerd community. He's huge on YouTube and Twitter. I'd I'd be interested why they would do the hardback and the paperback at the same time. Oh, they didn't. I, I, I just mean, said. no, the, it, on, when it came out in hardback, it debuted on the New York Times bestseller list. And then when it came out on paperback, it oh. also debuted on the New York Times bestseller okay, list. Okay, I was very confused. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the last little bit of background that I have here is on December 5th, 2014, the cover page for the script of The Martian was launched into space on an Orion spacecraft because that's just cool. Is it? Yeah. Okay. Um, so for those of you who have been living under a rock or haven't read the book or watched the movie, The Martian is the story of an astronaut who is stranded on Mars after his whole crew thinks that he died. And they blast reasonably. off in an emergency. Yes, they, they reasonably. reasonably think that he has died. Uh, and they blast off to save themselves in an emergency situation. They leave him behind. And now he's presented with, how do I survive on Mars alone 
for what he expects is going to be four years until the next Mars mission dun, arrives. Dun, dun. And uh, yeah, That's it's just fantastic. Okay, can I start with the intro? Go for it. Okay, you guys, my favorite part. <laughs> Not my favorite part. There's going to be so much more about this that I love, of course. But the very, it's like one of the very best intros to a book ever. The first couple of lines, I'm going to read them to you. Um, if you have children nearby, cover their ears. This has swear words. Um, I'm pretty much fucked. That's my considered opinion. Fucked. It's just the best line. Yeah. It's just the best. Like what? Oh, like it just, it, it just captures your attention. Yeah. It's funny and I love it. And I, I, I love the humor of this book. I think that's one of my favorite things. And the first page, you just get so, you get so much insight to who this guy, like what this guy's character is and and his sense of humor, which is super dry, and yeah. I love it. Really, it's like the two most important aspects of the book are included in the first line, which is impending doom mm -hmm. and humor. Yeah. Like, this is a guy who's going to be presented with a situation where he's probably going to die, but he's going to do it in an upbeat, funny way. Well, and there's a third thing. Yeah. His considered opinion. Yes. This is a scientist this who knows smart. what the heck he's doing. Yeah. And he has considered this. Yeah. He's not panicking. He no. has assessed the situation. Uh -huh. He's fucked. And it's funny. Yeah. Welcome to the Martian. <laughs> and then you get like a quarter of the way through that first page and the, you already have so much information. The exposition is phenomenally done. Yes. They don't, he doesn't, nothing is overwrought. He explains what's happening. He explains it concisely. But you don't feel like, you know, you get some of those movies that you're just like, oh, this is, oh, like gravity, where the <laughs> beginning of it is just like the exposition is so stupid. Oh, we're here because of your uh, experiment, which I know nothing about. Will you please explain the whole thing to me? Like, yeah. that's not what this is. Yeah. Um, that's what gravity was. It is helped along by the fact of one of the smartest decisions that anywhere made is that it is a, it's not just a first person uh, dialogue. It's, it's really, it's almost a second person dialogue or a second person narrative. He's telling you this. Mm, mm -hmm. This is a this is the story of someone writing a journal basically. We are reading his logs. Yeah. And so it's not a third person narrative where omniscient god is telling us this and it's not even a first person narrative where we're experiencing things as he experiences them. He's laying it out in his log and therefore the whole thing is sort of given a license to be expositional because yeah. he's describing a situation. And it still doesn't feel overly expositional. It's yeah, amazing. Yeah, it's crazy. And uh, so okay, going back to the sense of humor. Yeah. He has this line where he's talking about, you know, if he were in command. Mm -hmm. And and he talks about how he's lowest on the totem pole. He is the last one in line. If everyone else were yeah. dead and he was the last one on, alive, he would be in command. And then he says, what do you know? I'm in command. And, it, <laughs> and it's, just, it's just a little wicked, which yeah. I think is so great. Yeah. Um, anyway, so there's that. Yes. And just really, like, I'm sure we're going to be coming back to this over and over both tonight and for the rest of the time that we do The Martian which is he's just so much fun. Mm -hmm. The character is fun. And that is like, I'm sure that other writers would have approached this and tried to make it dire and grim and like kind of hopeless and really try to raise the but stakes. But we've seen that so many times. We've seen it so many times. And at a certain point it starts to strain credulity mm -hmm. because you know what? You are fucked, man. You're stranded on Mars. Nobody's coming. You don't have any food. You're going to die. Why is he not just taking the Vicodin that he specifically mentions morphine. he had, or uh, morphine that he specifically mentions he has, and just ending it quickly, because he's an upbeat guy. Yeah, he's an optimist. He's, yeah, exactly. He is, we have established that this is the kind of guy who doesn't get depressed easily, mm -hmm. who, who approaches situations logically, who tries to work through, and who believes that he can pull it off. And that's what keeps the whole story afloat. Um, so we have like not gotten very far in this chapter like at all. So... Um, Moving along. <laughs> uh, one of the things that I really, really like, and I'm going to probably hit this multiple times mm -hmm. throughout talking about chapter one, which is he says um, it wasn't your fault. He does a what it wasn't your fault note to the crew um, just in case they ever get to read it or mm -hmm. hear about it. And it puts the audience in his pocket because we love it when people are funny and gracious, even when their circumstances 
directly argue against them being funny and gracious. Yeah, he and had, forgiving. And forgiving. Like, yeah. And he he lays out exactly why the crew would think he's dead. And he mm-hmm. would have, he says he would have thought the exact same thing. And so would we. Like, he makes yeah. a good case. Clearly, anybody reading this who thinks I wouldn't have assumed he was dead is kidding themselves. Yeah. Like, yes, you would. And so the nice thing is, is now we as the audience don't have to think about it again. We just yeah. get to go, okay, this is a good guy. He's not going to be bitter the entire time. Mm-hmm. And we don't have to concern ourselves with his feelings about being left behind. All we, we have to concern ourselves with is with his survival. And we also don't carry a burden of blame through the yep. whole thing. You know, late, mm-hmm. we, we aren't going to get there in these three chapters, but we do eventually meet the rest of his crew and we don't hate them. Yep. You know, like this is, if anything, we feel bad for them because they are the victims of circumstance that, you know, we know they feel terrible about this. Yep. And it's totally understandable mm-hmm. that they did it. So it, it really sets everybody up to be a hero. I like how he he talks about um, they had four months on the Hermes Mm -hmm. and how much fun it could have been. And he says, you know, I I could tell you about that, but I'm it's I'm too depressed right now. Mm -hmm. And all I all I could think about was like, who could I spend four months with? I mean, honestly, like I don't there are not very many people. Obviously, you. Um. Yep. I love him. Um, but, I mean, we, we lived yeah, in how New many Zealand people together, could you be, which is fine. Yeah, so. how many people could you be locked in a tin can with for four months? Yeah. And really, it's more like 12 months because you have four months there and then a month on the surface and then, and then like four or five months back. And it's like, it Yeah, that's up. a lot. Yeah. So, I don't know. I just I was just sitting there going, okay, I have a couple of friends that I think I could get through a yeah. good while with. Yeah. Um, it might wear our friendship thin, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that the Edgeworks team would want to spend that much time together. Yeah. To be fair, they get to go to Mars. <laughs> the, the number of people I would want to spend four months with is pretty small. The number of people that I would be willing to spend four months with to go to Mars is a lot bigger. I mean, <laughs> no, actually it, like it's inverse yeah. for me. Cause I, I'm sitting here going. But I need everybody to be on the ball, and my survival depends on these other people. No, no, yeah. no, no. It's actually I'd much I'd be much more willing to spend four months with people for no reason at all yeah. than on like an adventure that could be very stressful. Fair enough. <laughs> you know, one thing that's interesting. So I imagine that most of our audience that's listening to this has seen the movie, whether or not they've read the book. I certainly have. I'm going to try to sort of keep the movie discussion to a minimum, but every so often there are going to be little things that creep in. And one is that the book is based on his diary and it starts after the disaster. On page one, Mm -hmm. his crew has already left, he's alone, the story has begun. In the movie, they naturally start it a little earlier and you actually see the crisis that gets them all kicked out. And so as we're talking about sort of who would you spend all this time with, there is a funny little thing which is in the book, we don't actually know about these people very much. Like he yep. mentions Johansson, he mentions, you know, like a few Lewis people. And yeah. Yeah, like but he mentions a few people, but we don't really get a sense of the team dynamic. Whereas mm-hmm. in the movie, by the time they leave, we have seen them bantering. We've seen them sort of, you know, giving each other a hard time. Around. And yeah, exactly. Yeah. So it's it's interesting to start from this place of only knowing him. I will say for those of you who know Edgeworks and Terra Genesis, you might know this, but for those of you who don't uh, Terra Genesis came about because of this movie. So like if just to, as a part of the community, I feel like if you haven't watched this movie, <laughs> it's imperative that you watch it mostly for your own sake, but also cause like, yeah, it's welcome Terra to Genesis our world. Lore, right? It is. Yeah. It totally it's is. for those who don't know, uh, I had been thinking about making a terraforming game for a long time, but it was actually during, uh, Lacey and I went to go see a movie and one of the trailers before that movie was a trailer for The Martian and all of a sudden it occurred to me you know I should really have my game about colonizing Mars available when this movie about colonizing Mars comes out and that was the impetus to start making Terra Genesis and get it going mm. so yeah it was yeah. it was you know an integral bit of the history of that game so, so something else about this book that yeah. I think is is going that is similar to you is uh this guy mark watney is going to make science cool yes. i just kept thinking that over and over again because like he, there's a there's a lot of detail which i love like we we complained about that mm-hmm. in gravity and the, even a little bit in apollo 13 though we did 
yeah. find some some areas in which they had a lot of detail. Yeah. Um, but this one, like he talks about how the supplies for Ares three being on route um, while the Ares two crew heads home, and there's like that fractional portion of me that's type A that loves all of this detail and like yeah. the organization and how does it work, and hearing him talk about it mm -hmm. is just cool. Oh, and yeah. I I kept sitting here going. Where was this? Where were these stories when I was in high school? I really thought I hated science until this guy came along and he's like, no, science is cool. <laughs> let me tell you why. And I was like, I'm never going to learn any of this stuff, but you can talk to me about it always. And that's how you I are feel. learning it. Well, I mean, yes, but but Mark Watney, this character makes science cool, yeah. which is which is interesting. I just never you know, it's taken me a long time to recognize that that could be true yeah. for me as a non I was always the the theater kid and the I liked English and history and science was not my jam. Yeah. So and that is really one of the things that the Martian is rightfully famous for is like we're going to we're going to walk you through atmospheric composition calculations and make it really cool. Like everything is laid out in a very smart and approachable way. Um, I actually have a note here that it's interesting how like from the very beginning, it's clear that this is going to be a smart story. But it's interesting how there are certain things that he explains, like how the thrusters work or how the suit's air cycles work. He goes into a lot of detail. But then there are other things that he just kind of tosses out there and just kind of assumes that you'll pick up or, that, or assumes that you already know. Like he just starts referring to the hab. And he, mm -hmm. doesn't, he never actually says what the hab is, but you, you either know or you pick it up, you know? Yeah. And that, I think, is a, is a sort of a sneaky way of making the audience feel smart too, mm -hmm. that he's not just teaching you He's telling you a story that you're keeping up with. Yeah. And, yeah, and, that's, really and that's so good, too. I feel like, and that's yeah. something we talk a lot about at work is, is the, how do you, how, how do we have stories that don't dumb things down for the audience who is not dumb? The exactly. The audiences are not stupid. They're really smart. And you might know more about science than I do, but that doesn't make me an idiot. Right. So don't talk this down to me. This stuff is cool. Yeah, it's yeah. cool. So make it cool and make it interesting enough for me to want to watch it yeah. and get invested. So I, I, I don't know. I feel like this first chapter just really mm -hmm. hits a lot of like, this is who we are and this is what we want Edrix yeah. to be. So it feels really good to read it and see it happen. So this is a show about scientific accuracy. So mm -hmm. we would be remiss if we didn't mention the one thing in this book that isn't scientifically accurate. Yes. This is yep. Andy Weir put a huge premium on keeping everything scientifically accurate. In fact, he actually built a physics simulator on a computer to calculate the orbits of Earth and Mars and calculate the acceleration of the Hermes spacecraft. And you can actually look up on YouTube these simulations of how the ship sort of pings around the solar system and how many days it takes. Like when they show up on Sol, you know, 469, it's because that's actually how long it would take given the orbits right. and the, all that. That's so um, cool. But Andy Weir did say he gave himself one pass. Mm -hmm. One thing that is not realistic, and that is the opening incident. So the way Mark Watney gets stranded on Mars is there's a dust storm, the likes of which have never been seen, and it reaches the thresholds that NASA calls an abort on the mission. They were going to be there for 30 days, and instead they're there for six, and they blast off because this dust storm is threatening to tip over the MAV the Mars mm -hmm. Ascent Vehicle, which is what they're going to use to get back up to orbit. So rather than let it get knocked over, and now the whole crew is stranded, they tell them, just blast off now. This is not scientifically accurate. Mars's atmosphere is half of 1% as thick as Earth's atmosphere. Yeah. You could get hurricane speed winds on Mars, and you wouldn't even be able to feel it through your spacesuit. Like this, It would be a gentle breeze on your face if you weren't wearing a helmet, because the air is so just whisper-thin that y nothing is going to get that thing moving with enough force to knock over the MAV. Right. Let alone toss people around and rip off antennas and everything that it does. So the, the dust storm that starts the story is sort of an Earth phenomenon. But then from then on, pretty much everything in this story is dead on scientifically accurate. Well, okay, so let's go into how does he survive it? Because this yes. is one of my favorite parts is, <clears throat> first of all, there's this quote, which is, Delightful. I really like curse words, so I'm going to read all of them to you. Not all of them. There are many more in the book that I'm going to read than <laughs> what I'm going to read out loud. But he says um, about waking up. 
a steady obnoxious beeping that eventually roused me from a deep and profound desire to just fucking die. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Honestly, it's so, it's just so lovely. It's just so lovely. Yeah. But so what he's talking about is um, the he starts to dis describe the hole in his suit and how the antenna went through the suit and through his side and and it made a because he ended up on it like upside he landed face down in the sand yeah. it created torque which helped seal the well the seal came from the gunk of the blood but it created what yeah, the, the, the the torque of the thing as he lay on it sort of pulled the hole closed a little bit yeah and then and his then blood, blood falls into the hole and again mars's atmosphere is so thin that water naturally sublimates it just sort of instantly evaporates mm -hmm. so as his blood hit the hole it immediately evaporated which means it basically formed an insta scab that filled in the hole for the most part so there is one question that I have, and I feel like I should know the answer to this because we're scuba divers, <laughs> yep. but why does it backfill with nitrogen? Okay, so uh, a quick primer on how humans breathe. Uh, Earth's atmosphere is about 70% nitrogen and 21% oxygen, and then the rest is just sort of other stuff. Oxygen is obviously very important to humans for breathing. Nitrogen, on the other hand, does nothing. Like literally, it's just filler. Nitrogen is utterly useless. And so there are situations like with scuba diving where you can actually breathe other things. Um, there's something called argox, which is oxygen and argon. Um, there's heliox, which is uh, oxygen and helium. You can put a lot of gases in instead of nitrogen, but what nitrogen does is it keeps up the air pressure. So it just sort of fills the air enough to where it has as much air pressure as humans need, and then you keep a certain amount of oxygen. So every spacesuit has an oxygen tank and then a nitrogen tank that it can use to keep the pressure up. So when his suit started venting out into the Martian atmosphere, it was giving him some oxygen to keep the oxygen level up, but mostly it was giving him nitrogen to keep the air pressure up in his suit. Ah. Okay. And so what it and so as he walks you through the steps of what was happening, it's venting nitrogen, it's it's backfilling with nitrogen, but then it runs out of nitrogen and so it starts backfilling with oxygen, but there is actually such a thing as too much oxygen. There's oxygen right, right, toxicity, right. Yeah. which is why all of a sudden it starts venting that to sort of try to keep him at the right level of carbon dioxide and nitrogen and oxygen and everything and finally the oxygen alarm is what wakes him yeah. up, is you're getting too much oxygen, it might do damage, wake the hell up. And he <laughs> says, like, at the, the moment that he wakes up, it's, like, 80%. Yeah. So, which you is know, a lot. Which is a lot. Earth's but atmosphere it's, is but 20. He, it's, it, it's low enough that he should be able to get back to the hab. Yeah. Fine, if he gets a move on. Mm -hmm. um, so, one of the other things that, that happens here is, do you guys remember, I, I've been thinking about it a lot, do you guys remember that viral video that went around of the the guy who was like trail running and then what a mountain lion comes out yeah, and is like, like he sees like the cub and then the mountain lion follows him for a long time. It's like six or and, seven minutes yeah. of him slowly backing away and this thing just <laughs> yeah. coming along. And doing like the the thing where like yeah, scrabbles at him. Like yeah. Bats and, toward him. There's this moment in the video that makes me laugh really hard because he's like, nope. And I, it's just like, it's something that yeah, is so just... today. Like that's, that's a phrasing that we, that's kind of a colloquialism of right now. Yeah. And I love, I love how Andy Weir writes Mark Watney because there's a moment where he says um, that like, he, he uses uh, yay and boo mm -hmm. in parentheses. Yeah, he says, I came like, up over the ridge and I saw something that made me really happy and something that made, re made me really sad. The hab was intact. Yay! But the MAV was gone. Boo. boo. <laughs> <laughs> and it's just like these little bits kind of keep the whole thing from feeling really depressing and grim. Yeah. And or too sciencey. Like this yeah. is this is not a college professor who's here to just tell you about electrical engineering. This mm -hmm. is a guy who's gonna tell you about electrical engineering, but then uh, you know, thirty seconds later, he's going, "Yay, yeah. boo!" <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I so he talks about why the the crew leaves. Like yeah. they have to get to the Hermes, and the Hermes has to go now. Yes. And he says that it's 
um, the orbital dynamics make the trip safer and shorter the earlier le you leave. Mm -hmm. Now, is that true or is that just to up the stakes? Do no, you know? that's no, that's definitely true. So what uh, what he's referring to is, uh, if I'm remembering the the part correctly, he's talking about why they didn't come back and get his body, uh, because he says, why give that up for some sentimentality? Um, is uh, that the well, no, why the Hermes has to leave. Because he's already talked about why they you don't want to have extra weight. Mm -hmm. And the Mav can't land again mm -hmm. because it doesn't have the parachutes. Yeah. So, like, that's just not going to happen. Right. But he's talking about why, I mean, they leave, why the Hermes has to go immediately. Like, as soon as the crew gets there, they have to leave. Yeah. So, I mean, it's sort of twofold. The first is, yes, from an orbital, orbital dynamic standpoint, you know, Mars and Earth are getting farther and farther away from each other every second. So the, if you're trying to hurry back home, you, the longer you wait, the longer the journey is. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of those weird things about space that sort of has no analog on Earth is different islands are always the same distance from each other. They aren't drifting around. Whereas in space, however long you wait determines how long the journey is going to be. Um, but then the other factor is that, you know, they took the MAV. So, like, what would you wait for? There's nothing else right, coming back up true. from yeah, the surface. Yeah. So you just go. Yeah, you're just going to wave at Mars yeah, until exactly. you're supposed you just to leave. Be sad. Like, you're, <laughs> okay. you've got four months to get <laughs> right. back to Earth. You've got plenty of time to right. be sad. Um, so, I guess, I don't know. I've got one, I've got just like one way, thing I want to reiterate before we yeah. end chapter one. Go for it. Um, I really like that Andy Weir feels like a magician because he's he's laid out this great argument for why Mar why Mark Watney is screwed and why no one is at fault. And so because of that, we can focus on his survival rather than, like we said, mm -hmm. all of the feelings that might come up with him being left behind. So it's like Andy Weir's like, look over here, look over here, instead of over here at what we would normally look at, the what mm -hmm. what these stories often are in terms of being grim and we get really caught up in our humanity, essentially, which means we get really caught up in our emotions and our feels and our yeah. emotions and our emotions our, and our all of that. Our lizard brain instead of our scientist brain. Yeah, exactly. So I just, it, it really feels like magic in the way that, I, because I, I, as a person who loves story and acting and all of that, I tend to get very caught up in what's fair and what's not. Mm -hmm. And he's just completely overridden that for me. Yeah. And that, that, that's really special, mm -hmm. <laughs> to, in my opinion. Oh, yeah. So uh, good on Andy Weir. Well, and it's actually kind of the perfect segue into chapter two, because, you know, on the one hand, he wants to keep this story upbeat. He wants to keep it from just being grim. But on the other hand, you do need stakes. Mm -hmm. And so one really great way of dealing with that is chapter one, He's kind of depressed. Like, he starts out with, I'm fucked. And he ends the chapter with, yeah, so I'm fucked. And then chapter two starts, and he immediately says, all right, so I feel a lot better after a night's sleep. Yeah. And it's like, okay, don't we've we all? established the stakes. We've established everything that's against him. We've established all the reasons we, why he's going to die. Now let's get to work. Yes. Like, okay, he's Mark Watney. He's, he's an upbeat guy. He's had a night's sleep. He's had some food. Let's get to work and solve the problem. And that's like what this story and, is about. And part of and part of the having a good night's sleep and thinking of everything logically is he even says pretty up front, as we mentioned before, is I'm not going to slowly starve to death. I'll tell you that. Yeah. Because he's got morphine. Yeah. He's like, I will find I will I take will take that. Yeah, yeah, I'm not gonna starve to death. So I I just I can't I couldn't believe that when I read that it didn't just sound super grim. It sounded like a logical decision by mm -hmm. an optimistic man. Yeah, that's and that's the baseline. That. Yep. Let's work up from here. Yes. Yeah. So, um, again, good on Andy Weir. Yes. Mark Watney. The first line that I have here about Chapter 2 is, great inventory of assets and problems. Chapter 2 starts with just a list. Here's what I've got. Here's what is arrayed against me. Just bam, 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 bam. Here, he just sort of sets the stage. Mm -hmm. So you, you can almost think of it like a workman's table. Here are all my tools. What can we make with this? Yeah. <laughs> and it really has, you know, back uh, a couple of weeks ago when we were talking about Apollo 13, there's a, there's a moment where they have to get an air filter from one machine to work in a different machine that wasn't designed for it. And they sort of spill all this stuff out onto a table and they say, this is what we have to work with. Let's figure this out. And there's a quote that I that I read, which was, the Martian is for everyone who wished that that scene 
was the whole movie. <laughs> yeah. And that really yeah. feels true. It's like, that's, that's what this chapter that's, is. is that's, it's laying everything out on the table and saying, okay, what can we do with this? That scene in Apollo 13 is just so great and it's so short. Mm -hmm. So that's exactly what this book feels like. And, yeah. and, and, and just like the, in a fun, high stakes way. Mm -hmm. um, By the way, uh, while we're mentioning Apollo 13, one thing that struck me on, so I've, I've read The Martian before, I've seen the movie. One thing that struck me on this reread is clearly this story is inspired by Apollo 13 in a lot of ways. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, things going wrong in space is always gonna have some kind of connection to back to Apollo 13, especially if it's things going wrong in space and we're working the problem. But one thing that really struck me this time is there are a lot of pretty direct homages to Apollo 13. Mm -hmm. Stuff like, this is the third mission. He specifically outlines a, a progression of the Ares missions that parallels the Apollo missions. Apollo 11 was the first to land on the moon. Apollo 12 landed on the moon. And then Apollo 13 was going to be the third mission and then things went wrong. <laughs> Ares 1 landed on Mars. Ares 2 <laughs> landed on Mars. What? I just... <laughs> I was thinking back to that episode of yeah. the Apollo 13 where I was like, yeah, we landed on Mars once. <laughs> Alex, the moon. Yeah, or the, the moon, moon once. once. And yeah. I, Alex was like, uh, Lacey, yeah, we've landed to, on the moon a lot more than that. I, I had to pull her aside uh, after the after the episode and be like, we landed on the moon. I, than listen, once. I know nothing. Space history is not my jam. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, that's why I'm laughing through this because I'm just like, I was thinking of, yeah. oh my God, how embarrassing. Uh, well, I wasn't going to bring it up, but you know. Oh, you you're so you. sweet. Uh, but yeah, so this is this is clearly, you know, the he, he specifically says Ares 1 was the first group to land on Mars. They came back and they had like, you know, ticker tape parades and everything. Uh, Ares 2 landed on Mars and they got like a firm handshake and a cup of coffee, which is kind of what Apollo 12 got. Like people got jaded about landing on the moon pretty quick. And then Apollo 13 was the one where everything went wrong, just like Ares 3 is the mm -hmm. one where everything went wrong. Yeah. So it's definitely drawing a lot from the Apollo 13 experience. Um, I like I liked this log entry that was, um, I'm well fed and I have a purpose. Fix the damn radio. Yeah. And it's just, he's so goal oriented and he, ex he explicitly tells you what he's going to do next and yeah. explains how he's going to do it and what he's been thinking about and Mm -hmm. You know, you get to kind of see the mulling, which yeah. is just, I don't know, there's just something fun about being inside someone's brain that is so smart and getting to follow along as someone who, while quite intelligent, is not that kind of smart. That's mm -hmm. not, that's not my thing. That will never be my thing. I don't well, want it to be, and, but, it, but I still get to follow it and I get to understand it. It's so neat. That is one of the things that I think this story does better than almost maybe any story I've ever seen, is it captures the important part of science. Because so much of what people think of as science is really memorizing other people's results. It's memorizing how the life cycle of a cell works, or you know, like these things that scientists have discovered, but that's not science. Science is not a body of knowledge. Science is a process of approaching problems. And this story really captures that, that, you know, when you're presented with a problem, you don't need to give in to your emotions. You don't need to freak out. You don't need to, you know, reach for any of these things. You just work the problem. And a lot of what he does is beyond what the audience could do. You know, like you need to know electrical engineering. You need to know all sorts of, you know, chemical formulas and stuff like that. But a lot of what he does is pretty simple math. You know, like at one point he's just totaling up the square footage of the hab, and here's how much land area I have to grow potatoes. Okay, then I've also got these bunks that I'm not using. They're each two square meters, so that brings it up to, you know, 102. And then, oh, I've got the, the rovers, and like he's doing this stuff. How much water do I need for this, this much soil? Well, that's something that if you just walked up to somebody on the street and was like, hey, you've got 117 square meters of soil. How much water do you need for that? I think most people would be like, I don't know. But think about it. Like... How much water do you need for one square meter of soil? You can probably just look that up and then you multiply that by 116 or whatever and then you're done. Like yeah. a lot of these are not really complicated problems. They're just not the kind of thing that the average person has trained themselves to just figure out. Yeah. And that's the spirit of this story. And that is well, what science I mean, it goes is. A, it goes a little bit further than that because I think that 
what we see is a lot of simple problems that are compounded by other problems. Yes. And so he talks about how this is how many potatoes I can grow. And then he comes back and he's like, no, it's not. I can, when they, when they start to uh, germinate, mm -hmm. um, I can push them deeper and I can plant potatoes on top of it, which most- or Move them to deeper soil and plant new. No, 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 I think he's talking about you push them deeper and you plant above them because that's how a lot of potato okay. growing works is you, you can do it in layers, mm -hmm. but potato farmers wouldn't do that because they've got millions of potatoes yeah. to deal with. It's not cost effective. It's not, yeah, no. and, and so why would you do that? But for him, he's going to do the potatoes in layers mm -hmm. and that's really smart. I mean, now, I, I, that was my understanding yeah. of it because I think he's going to have the same depth of dirt for the entire place. Maybe. I, my understanding was moving them to a different spot, but who knows? I, I'm So a lot of, from my gardening experience, yeah. <laughs> I know that. Uh, I think it's like potatoes and onions. You can yeah. do layers of them. Interesting. And there's, okay. yeah. I had no idea. It's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, oh, look at that. I yeah. My gardening has come in handy. Fear your botany powers. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Fear my powers. Um, yeah, it's, that is... Just what I love about this story. Um, I, I'm gonna. There's there's one log entry, uh, Soul Eleven. Yeah. Uh, where he just says, it's one line. I wonder how the Cubs are doing. And I'm like, dude, my dude, my dude. <laughs> I'm with you. How are the Cubs doing? And I love that Mark Watney is from Chicago, yeah. and and he's like rooting for the underdog because at this point, the Cubs had not broken their curse. When this book came out, yeah. they had not overcome that and i was just sitting here going spoiler alert my friend if you live long enough <laughs> you will lose your mind because yeah. the cubs were will also <laughs> be like making this great big comeback so you guys can be friends Working forever together. and i'm so like i don't know there's just something about the underdog rooting for the underdog and i always love the underdog and so i was here for it by and the way uh chicago earned their ownership of mark watney because among those people that we were talking about earlier as people would email in and talk to andy weir about how we would solve this kind of problem apparently a significant contingent of them were from the the University of Chicago or oh. whatever. He, he mentions his alma mater at one point, and the reason that that is his alma mater is because the they had a significant oh, chunk awesome. of people contributing so to So it's like story. one person was like, hey, did you guys read this comic? You yeah, have to read this comic. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's yeah. awesome. Um, um, there is, uh, I, made a, I made a note here, which is, you know, as much as I love the first person sort of, or second person kind of diary format of uh -huh. this story, it is an interesting choice because what it means is we never actually see him working out a problem we only ever see him talking about how i don't know how i'm going to solve this mm -hmm. and then he shows up the next day and he says so i figured it out here's how i did it i don't completely agree with that in chapter three he yeah. he you get to see i mean he goes back through how he works worked out a, a problem well that's what i mean is it's it's interesting because these are diary entries we don't actually see him sort of trial and erroring his way through uh, he mostly it's just it's a fait accompli hey i figured it out here's what i did yesterday okay and touché, he sort touché. of walks you through the solution which i think simultaneously you know keeps the story flowing because he's not going down a million false starts but it also helps contribute to this sense of Again, that term that we keep using on this show, competence porn. Yeah. And because we sort of only see the successes because he says, oh, yeah, I tried a few things, but here's what worked. And so it's just a series of him describing the success. Mm -hmm. And it's just that uh, competence so porn. Good. So, so good. So um, good. There's another great, uh, there are two great quotes, and you already alluded to one of them, but I have them here. Uh, <clears throat> He's talking about how he's going to make soil out of Martian dirt, mm -hmm. and at one, and he's talking about how he's gathered up all of the uh, the bags of poop yeah. that have been left out on 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 the yeah. surface of Mars from his crewmates, and how he's going to put them all into all of it. He's going to open and put into a big, you know, like container or yeah. whatever, and he's going to put in his newer. Um, excrement and he's going to put in a little water and the bacteria is going to do its thing and he this is how he's making soil that then his yeah, potatoes can grow he can he can put in sand and then martian dirt and then this fertilizer and then um uh earth dirt mm -hmm. and he goes 
my asshole is doing as much to keep me alive as my brain. And I cackled. I cackled. <laughs> I loved it. It was yes. so funny. Oh, so good. Good swearing. The, the asides and the little, uh, you know, whenever he, he gets increasingly invested in the TV shows that his crewmates yeah. brought, <laughs> uh, like Three's Company. Yeah. And, you know, there's just, there's so many good little sort of character moments and asides that are. Like this one. Mm. Hell yeah, I'm a botanist. Fear my botany powers. Yeah. And which like I said, you just alluded to, but it yeah. was, oh, again, I'm just like, this man is funny. I want to be his friend. <laughs> one of one of the great lines from the movie trailers that got played everywhere uh, that I think comes in later in the book, it might have been invented for the movie, is uh, Mark Watney looking up into the camera and saying, I am the greatest botanist on this planet. <laughs> <laughs> Which is just one of those great little, you yeah. know, technically true kind of jokes. Yeah. yeah. I feel um, like I actually was friends with this guy in high school because yeah. he talks about how he was like a D and D guy, and oh, he's yeah. like, big on he, I, I don't know if you if you know this, but I was a big nerd in high school, mm. and it just makes me shout out to Travis, who was the biggest nerd I knew, and mm. I didn't fully know it, but this it just he's not an optimist like yeah. this, but I feel like I would have been this guy's friend. And shout out to Lacey, who if anybody doubts Lacey's nerd cred, she brought me into her weekly D and D game. I I had never played Dungeons and Dragons until I met her. Well, and so. Is it in this? Oh yes. Okay. He. We'll talk about the Dungeons and Dragons stuff in yes. chapter three because he talks about it more. Which uh, I'm all done with chapter two. I'm. Uh, I think. Okay. So my last thing about uh, chapter two. two is hold on. Um, he he, Andy Weir got me so caught up in the science that I managed to forget how anyone connected to this character might feel which is fascinating because he's done that he's forgotten like to think about how his parents are feeling mm -hmm. and i was so caught up in the science that i didn't think about it and that's out of that is of not work. normal at all for mm -hmm. who i am as a person and then and then he at the end of the chapter reality comes crashing back in we've had a lot of fun this chapter there's been a lot of humor and a lot mm -hmm. of optimism and there's just like this pattern and I like got really upset because I was like, oh yeah, we're going to, he's going to survive. We're going to do this. Yes. And then Andy Weir's like, ha, ha, ha. and he comes in and he just like Godzilla's all over it. <laughs> and the rose colored glasses just go like shatter everywhere. And I, I found it upsetting. I found it really well, what upsetting. What did he do? What did he, how did he stomp all over? What I don't even remember. Hold on. <laughs> I mean, I can look. <laughs> but I don't remember exactly what it was. I Liz think it's I think it's the water. I think he says that he has no idea how he's gonna come is that up what with it the is? water. Yeah. I don't know. Because then chapter three begins as he's talking about oh, like yeah. how do I generate water. Oh yeah. He talks about how like he's got a thousand days of, it's it's the water, but it's the potatoes. Mm -hmm. And he has to continually grow them and how many calories does he need? And so he said it ends with there's about a thousand days of food I don't have and I don't have a plan for how to get it. Mm -hmm. shit so yeah. and you're just like Ugh. Ugh. Um, yeah. okay. but luckily he comes through and the uh, Ares 3 mission was supposed to be on Mars over Thanksgiving and so the shrinks at NASA as he put it uh, decided that the crew ought to cook a meal together rather than having everything just ready to be microwaved or whatever as astronauts generally do they sent along a, a, a small package of real live non-freeze-dried potatoes so mm -hmm. that the crew can cook a thanksgiving Which dinner is together the only reason that he would manage to exactly. would be able to manage any of this right. is because normally that's not you know they would be frozen potatoes and then he'd have been screwed yes and but he'd as have it morphined, is so. he can generally he can generate soil he can plant the potatoes and grow in more potatoes and that becomes his plan mm -hmm. um all right Chapter three? Yep. All right. So he's doing a bunch of algebra and he doesn't explain it. <laughs> and I, uh, I have this thing about the first few chapters, he's been going through all yeah. of the math and I- What is it? What is he trying to calculate? It? I don't remember. See, listen, you guys, I tried to reread chapter three so it was fresh in my mind. And my husband kept distracting me I'm like sure a I, child. I'm shocked, shocked at that accusation. He was so rude. Ugh. He would, uh, uh, so. Oh. to find that there's gambling going on in this establishment. Oh, my God. That's a little... Whatever. 
Whatever. Casablanca. Watch it. It's awesome. For, for once, he wasn't talking to me because Carry on. I have actually seen it now, finally, as of this summer. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, what is he doing? Because you did ask. So um, he's talking about uh, still creating calories. Yeah. Um, so he needs essentially uh, 1,425 days of food. Mm-hmm. So anyway... I, w- I would not have minded him doing the algebra because I feel like if Mark, Wat- Mark Watney explained it to me, I would understand it. <laughs> and he didn't explain it to me, and I don't entirely begrudge him of that. Yeah. But so far, so good on the explanations. Yes. Excellently done. So he has this plan. He's going to plant potatoes in the soil that he's generating himself all over the floor of the hab. Mm-hmm. But he needs water. Yes. And that is sort of the, the problem that we are left with uh, at the end of chapter three. But he's working through how do I generate water? And he's shoveling in a lot of dirt from the Martian surface and trying to maximize where he can grow it. He's growing it on the ground. He's growing it on his crewmates' bunks. He's growing it on tables. He's growing it in the rovers and the rovers' pop tents, for, which are for emergencies. He's really maximizing the amount of area that he can turn into farmland on mars Mm -hmm. um it's there was one moment where he said that he had um prepped the the bunks so that Mm -hmm. they could carry that amount of weight of soil and i was like the soil's gonna the soil's gonna be heavier than a person really but yeah that's true i mean yeah well Well, i mean i guess you picture a bag of fertilizer that is smaller than a person and it's heavy as hell so yeah, yeah well i mean remember We've got these, like, I, I started gardening, and we've got these massive pots in back that are unmovable. Yeah. I don't know how we're ever going to move them. It's true. Um, you guys, there are tricks for this. Put uh, pl- milk, milk bottles at the bottom and then put soil on top. Then you can move them. <laughs> Just so you know, that's right. why, why fill the entire thing. Yeah, why fill the seriously. entire thing? Um, okay, so I felt like he's done a really good job with the emotional roller coaster. Yeah. Um, just in the in the explaining of all of the math and the science, he's still he's not making the science and math super dry. Mm-hmm. He's still you're encountering all of the emotions that mm-hmm. come with this, and not just his, but yours. Mm-hmm. And I don't know. I I thought it was woven quite lovely. Lovely. <laughs> yeah, that is exactly how I was um, going to say that. Not a word. I uh, One thing that I really appreciate, because again, this is one of those things that I think any lesser writer would have been tempted to do, and Andy Weir doesn't, and it's so the right choice. And that is, he doesn't flirt with madness. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of these stories like Cast Away, you've got Tom Hanks developing a budding relationship with a volleyball and like kind of going into you know, crazy not guy territory. Not to say that that wouldn't happen. No, but it might not. And a lot of writers treat it as sort of a given that if you're alone for more than three days, then you're immediately going nuts. And I really appreciate that. No, you know what? Mark Watney is lonely and he's scared and he's worried that he's going to die, but he's also like, okay. But he's also got tethers to the outside world in ways that like Castaway doesn't, Yeah. you know, cause you, he still can listen to music. He can watch TV it's true. shows and yeah. um, he can, you know, pretend like he's talking to someone by doing the diary it's true the volleyball again i'm not i'm not saying that like this had to be what i'm what i'm saying is that a lot of these stories you know i've seen movies and tv shows where somebody's left alone for like you know a few months and all of a sudden they're like super quirky and eccentric and it's like okay but it's refreshing that you know spoiler alert by the end of this story he's still not really going nuts like he's well so a pretty resilient guy and i just think that was the right choice for this i think story. it was the right choice but i will say there's a line where he says um little hab on the prairie mm-hmm. and for me i found that really jolting as someone who grew up in the midwest i'm from south dakota and you know little house on the prairie takes place in Dishmit, south dakota and i hated those books i hated them because it was too lonely it was too barren it was mm-hmm. you know he, the the guy up and moves his family because he can like see a house Mm -hmm. and he's like no 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 that's not why i'm out here we're leaving Mm -hmm. so he's constantly like he's trying to get away from society now i could be wrong on some of this because i did not read all of the books because i hated it um sorry christine um 
but I, I can't stand it. And so the, the, the fact that he even said that, like brought up some serious anxiety for me because I don't, I don't want that for him, Mm. you know? And like he, like I said, he has these tethers to his past life Mm. and to the outside world, but it's, yeah. it's still, it's just, it sounds so lonely and it's so scary. And for me, I found that incredibly jolting. Yeah. Now, people who maybe don't have the same reaction to <laughs> Laura Ingalls Wilder <laughs> might not have the same, that might not be so yeah, I don't like, think that was traumatizing. Meant, I don't think that was meant to be a real zinger line. No, I, <laughs> not for, not for the boys. The boys weren't made to read that crap. Um, uh, so one of the other homages to Apollo 13 yep. is he talks about how the pop tents, how he would love to be able to use two of the three, um, uh, what are those called? The, the pop tent. Well, no, no, no. Oh. The, there are two pop tents and he's got like essentially three exits out oh, of the Oh, the airlocks. The airlocks. Yeah. And he would happily do give up two of the airlocks for the pop tents, but he can't figure out how... The, yeah. how the hab airlocks are so much bigger than the pop tents yeah you can't figure like, out how to connect the two and all i could think of was apollo 13 yeah. and how they had to get the two filters to fit together mm-hmm. and i was like man if he had access to his houston yep. he he'd Somebody have an answer figure someone would figure yeah. it out for him and i i don't know it just it, and he has to not do it he has yeah. to choose like okay i'm going to have to lose air every time i go in and out of the pop tents um, Which is actually something that is sort of worth mentioning, is that Mark Watney is not a superhero. There mm-hmm. are moments in this story where he comes against a problem and you just can't do that, I guess. Like, that's just, there's no there's no fix. You just have to work around it. Or he's not going to be the one who comes up with the answer. Yeah. Um, he, he, his his expertise only goes so far. He mm-hmm. doesn't have a round table of people yeah, he, to he had, lend their help. He specifically tells us his role in the mission was as the botanist and mm-hmm. as the mechanical, mechanical engineer. engineer. And so he's good at repairing things, which is great. He's good at growing food, which is great. But he's not going to be the one who you know, rewrites the code of the rover mm-hmm. or anything like that. He has a specific skill set, and he's not a just sort of all around perfect hero who can do anything. Yep. Which again, just makes the story more interesting. Um, so can we talk about the D and D part? Yes, we can talk about the D and D part. The D and D part. You guys, he, ta- he, he's talking about how he had played a cleric and he had this spell that was create water and he thought it was stupid. So he never used it. And now he's wishing mm-hmm. he had create water. And all I could think was, what would I want to do? I always play barbarians. Um, and so... Clearly. <laughs> like, I mean... <laughs> you making sound effects now? <laughs> uh, but, like, I just... I, I do... I like rages. <laughs> and I don't... You know, those aren't really things you need in real life. Yeah. Um, but you play clerics. I do. Is, and I have Create Water. You and do? I've never used it. Is there a spell that you wish you could have in real life? There are so many spells I wish I could have in real life. Like all the spells. I wish I could have create water. Even though you don't use it? Yeah, I don't use it in the game. I would use it in real life. Oh, man, I'm typing code. I don't want to go over to the water cooler. I want to just refill my oh, water. Oh, you would just get real lazy. Yeah. This is why we don't this have is the magic, purpose of you magic. guys. Yeah. This is why we this don't have it because humans would just for. be lazy assholes. Yep. <laughs> That's the idea. I would be real sneaky. That yes. would, that's what I would do. Yes. I would like create. You're, you are a barbarian in the game, but you are a rogue in real life. We don't need to talk about that. <laughs> it's true though. Um, okay. All right. So we're nearing the end of chapter uh-huh. three, I think. Yep. What do you got? Um, okay. So there's a moment. Um, I, I just, there's a moment at the end that's like sexy as fuck. <laughs> Oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, Tell I, us it's about totally it. weird, but the breakdown of the complex systems, and he's weighing the advantages and disadvantages, and he's explaining it all. And I'm not following it all super well because this guy's distracting me. <laughs> but I'm still, I'm sitting here, being distracted by my husband, while going, oh god, this guy's brain is so sexy. <laughs> Leave me alone. <laughs> that's that's this is how the key it to went. A healthy marriage. <laughs> Um, anyway, I yeah. just, I, 
I really liked the I liked the explanation yeah. of all of those how he's going to get water. Yeah. And why he's not going to do it this way because it's not worth it. It's really like he's got an we idea don't but it's up our whole air supply. Mm-hmm. We don't want to And he's like yeah. I've got an idea. It's real dangerous and dumb, but it's not dumb. It's incredibly intelligent. It's just real dangerous really risky and yeah. um i i loved it i mm-hmm. loved that part that takes us into chapter four which will be next week no 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 we're no? not done yet he i don't remember what he says but he's at one point he's like i'll be too dead to appreciate it and i something about the water but yeah. again cackling so much cackling yes. you guys but uh it ends do you know do you remember how Chapter with three the ends. Three's company reference. Yes, yeah. I simply can't abide the replacement of Chrissy with Cindy. Three's company may never be the same after this fiasco. Time will tell. <laughs> and I'm just like, oh my god, like I don't the the random yeah. old. They're not pop culture references. They're they're, they're like past. old culture references. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I love them, even though they don't all make sense to me. Because like hell, if I watched Three's Company, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know no. anything about it. <laughs> but I've seen in two different contexts people making jokes about how repetitive that show was. One of them is in The Martian, where he jokes that I watched uh, the episode of Three's Company where one of them uh, sees something and takes it out of context. The joke being that that happens in every episode of Three's Company. <laughs> and then again on Friends, there's a moment where uh, they're watching Three's Company and Chandler says, oh, this must be the episode of Three's Company where there's some kind of misunderstanding. And Phoebe get, picks up the remote and goes, oh, well, then I've seen this one <laughs> and changes the channel. So like, yeah, I don't need to watch Three's Company. Apparently it's all the same joke. But apparently. Um, but apparently replacing this character is, is a risky Is move. unacceptable. Yeah. So, so. anyway. So that uh, takes us to chapter four. We're going to be picking up with chapter four next week and uh, continuing our way through this book. It's going to be the next several episodes mm-hmm. of our show, making our way through The Martian. And then when we wrap up the book, we're going to have a special episode talking about the movie and uh, how it did adapting both the science and the book. Yes. So, you know, go get the book because it's most excellent yep. and it's not the exact same as the movie which is also incredible awesome but uh make sure you get it we're gonna start with chapter four mm-hmm. follow uh, along if you want um if you've got comments you can leave them on our youtube page where we'll be mirroring this episode you can put them on facebook or twitter we're mm-hmm. all over the place edgeworks entertainment and uh yeah if you have any questions we can jump into them in the next episode and we'd love for you to follow along yes Yes, All ask right. us questions, and we'll make Alex explain things to us Blah. together. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Thank you, guys. Have a good night. Thank you. Be sure to subscribe so you get the next episode.